evening. I'd like to start with a poem tonight. The ships sink before we blink, or so I think. This is a fine poem, not by Iowa City standards, perhaps, but at the very least, it rhymes. <laughs> Unfortunately, though, this work isn't timeless. If the action were in the past, it would read, the ship sank before we blinked, or so I thought. How could that be? Sink, blink, think, become sank, blinked, thought. Can we write this off as a linguistic quirk, simply another one of English's many eccentricities, like the silent K in night and knife? Not on Steven Pinker's watch. <laughs> For him, my poem is the catalyst to examine what language is and how we process it. Pinker is a linguist, evolutionary psychologist, and professor at Harvard. He serves on the usage panel of the American Heritage Dictionary, was twice nominated for a Pulitzer, and has been rated as one of the most influential people in the world by Time Magazine. With such a pedigree, Steven Pinker should be unbearably pedantic. He should grab us by the shirt drag us to a back alley, and bludgeon us with non-restrictive clauses and because I said so's. In his new book, The Sense of Style, he does the opposite, saying this about the authors of the elements of style. Today's writers cannot base their craft exclusively on the advice of men who developed their sense of style before the invention of the telephone, let alone the internet. Somebody called the estates of Strunk and White, they're gonna need some ice for that burn. <laughs> From there, Pinker recounts his struggle with the two different meanings of some. The conversational sum implies some, but not all. The logical sum means at least one, but does not rule out all. I got a headache reading papers in semantics that referred to them with labels borrowed from mathematics, Pinker writes, until at last I came across a limpid semanticist who referred to them as the only and at least senses, labels from everyday English, and I follow the literature ever since. This is the prose that Pinker writes, teaches, and advocates for, writing that is clear and approachable, but also heavily voiced. In the ossified genre of style guides, Pinker stands out for his raciness. When he explains the curse of knowledge, the tendency for authors to assume their readers know as much as they do, Pinker uses an example that any Iowa tailgater could relate to. Like a drunk who is too impaired to realize that he is too impaired to drive, we do not notice the curse because the curse prevents us from noticing it. When discussing the grammaticality of very unique, Pinker describes a flyer he was handed outside a cabaret in Provincetown. The copy read, The Atomic Bombshells, a dragtastic burlesque extravaganza featuring boylesque superstar Jet Adore, hosted by Seattle's premier fancy lady, Ben De La Creme. <laughs> wow. Pinker comments, the hostess who handed me the card promised that it would be, quote, a very unique show. Who would argue? <laughs> Pardon me if I'm blushing. With all this in mind, allow me to conclude with yet another poem. A book he wrote, pedantry he fought, our imagination he lit. Please help me welcome Harvard's Johnson Family Professor of Psychology, Steven Pinker. Thank you very much. Why is so much writing so bad? And how can we make it better? Why do we have to suffer through legalese as in the revocation by these regulations of a provision previously revoked subject to savings does not affect the continued operations. <laughs> Why do we put up with academies? As in, it is the moment of non-construction, disclosing the absentation of actuality from the concept in part through its invitation to emphasize in reading the helplessness of its fall into conceptuality. Why is it so hard to set the time on a digital alarm clock? <laughs> well, there's no shortage of theories, and the one that uh, I hear most often is summed up in this cartoon in which a boss says to a tech writer, good start, 
needs more gibberish. In, in other words, bad writing is a deliberate choice. Bureaucrats insist on gibberish to evade responsibility. The uh, plaid-clad nerds get their revenge on the girls who turned them down for dates in high school and the jocks who kicked sand in their faces. Pseudo-intellectuals try to bamboozle their readers with highfalutin gobbledygook, disguising the fact that they have nothing to say. Well, I have no doubt that the bamboozlement theory is true of some writers some of the time, but as a general explanation, it doesn't ring true. I know plenty of scientists and scholars who do groundbreaking research on important topics. They have nothing to hide and no need to impress, but still, their writing stinks. The second theory that uh, I uh, hear quite a bit is that it's digital media that are ruining the language. Google is making us stupid. <laughs> the digital age has produced the dumbest generation, which uh, stupefies young Americans and jeopardizes our future. Uh, Twitter is forcing us to write and think in 140 characters. Well, uh, if the dumbest generation theory were true, then an obvious implication of it is that it must have been much better before the age of digital media, such as the 1980s. And some of you are old enough to remember the 1980s. Uh, that was the era in which teenagers spoke in fluent paragraphs, in which uh, <laughs> bureaucrats wrote in plain English, and uh, every academic essay was a masterpiece in the uh, art of expression. You remember those days, don't you? Or was it the 70s? Uh, in fact, uh, bad writing has been with us in every era, and there have been people who have lamented it in every era. In 1961, for example, one commentator wrote, recent graduates, including those with university degrees, seem to have no mastery of the language at all. OK, well, that was the era of television. Maybe you have to go back before the invention of television or even radio, say, 1917. But back then, a commentator wrote, from every college in the country goes up the cry, our freshmen can't spell, can't punctuate. Every high school is in disrepair because its pupils are so ignorant of the merest rudiments. Well, maybe you have to go back even earlier, like the era of the European Enlightenment, in which a commentator wrote, our language is degenerating very fast. I begin to fear that it will be impossible to check it. And then there are the ancient grammar police who wrote, oh, for crying out loud, you never end a sentence with a little bird. <laughs> uh, I believe a better theory comes from an observation from Charles Darwin, who wrote, man has an instinctive tendency to speak, as we see in the babble of our young children, whereas no child has an instinctive tendency to bake, brew, or write. That is, Whereas speech is instinctive, writing is and always has been hard. The uh, reader is unknown, invisible, inscrutable, it exists only in the writer's imagination. The reader can't react or break in or ask for clarification. And as a result, writing is an act of pretense and writing is an act of craftsmanship. So what can we do to improve the craft of writing? For many decades, this question had a single answer. You hand the aspiring writer a copy of this, the iconic Elements of Style by William Strunk, Jr., a Cornell professor, and his uh, former student, E.B. White, who later went on to greater fame as uh, author of the children's classics, Charlotte's Web and Stuart Little. And note, as mentioned in the introduction, that these gentlemen were born before the turn of the century, uh, that is, the turn of the 20th century. Now, there's lots of good sense in the elements of style, and in many ways it deserves its iconic status. For example, they, they give uh, little bits of good advice, like use definite, specific, concrete language, write with nouns and verbs, put the emphatic words at the end, and my favorite, their prime directive, omit needless words, which is an excellent example of itself. On the other hand, uh, there are many reasons why the elements of style cannot be the basis of writing advice in the 21st century. For one thing, much of their advice is obsolete. Uh, for example, if you read through the entries in the elements of style, they'll tell you that to, it will, to finalize is a pompous, ambiguous verb. 
Now, it just so happened that to finalize was novel in the uh, day of Professor Strunk, and it grated on his ear, and so he ruled it out as a pompous, ambiguous word, whereas uh, language changes. Now it has become completely unexceptionable, and in fact, there is uh, no, no good uh, synonym. Similarly, they write, to contact is vague and self-important. Do not contact people. Get in touch with them, look them up, <laughs> phone them, find them, or meet them. Well, of course, Strunk and White did not live to see the uh, era in which you could also email someone or tweet them or text them or instant message them. But more to the point, there are times when you don't care how one person gets in touch with another as long as they do so. And for those occasions, to contact is a, an uh, excellent word. Again, it just happened to be new in their era. They failed to cultivate an ear for ongoing change in the language, and so they cooked up a reason why a word that just didn't sound right to them because young people were using it uh, ought to be avoided. Also, some of their advice is uh, quite baffling. Uh, for example, the word people is not to be used with it, words of number in place of persons. That is, you may not say six people. Why not? Well, here's the explanation. If of six people, five went away, how many people would be left? Answer, one people. <laughs> Did you get that? <laughs> By the same reasoning, you should never say, I have two children or 32 teeth. Uh, it would rule out any irregular plural. Or how's this? Note that the word clever means one thing when applied to people, another when applied to horses. A clever horse is a good-natured one, not an ingenious one. <laughs> the problem with traditional style advice is that it consists of an arbitrary list of do's and do don'ts based on the tastes and peeves of the author. Uh, it is not based on a principled understanding of how language works, and as a result, users have no way of understanding and assimilating the advice, and as I've just shown you, much of the advice is just wrong. I think we can do better today. We can base advice uh, on writing on the science and scholarship of language, on modern grammatical theory, which is, uh, represents an advance uh, beyond the pedagogical grammars that were based directly on Latin, on evidence-based dictionaries, on research from cognitive science on what makes sentences easy or hard to read, and on historical and critical studies of usage. And that's what I've tried to do in the sense of style. It all begins with a model of effective prose communication. Uh, as I've mentioned, writing is an unnatural act, and good style requires, above all, a coherent mental model of the communication scenario. That is, how the writer imagines the reader and what the writer is trying to accomplish. There are a number of uh, such models, but my Favorite and, and the most widely applicable comes from a book by the literary scholars Francis Noël Thomas and Mark Turner. I uh, may identify it as classic style. Now, the model behind classic style is that prose is a window onto the world. The writer has seen something in the world that the reader has not yet noticed. He positions the reader so that she can see it uh, with her own eyes. The reader and writer are equals. The goal of writing is to help the reader see objective reality, and the style is conversation. Now, that may sound obvious, but it is only one of a number of distinct styles. And uh, Thomas and Turner uh, describe a number of others, such as contemplative style, oracular style, and practical style. But the one that they uh, note that academics write in is one that they call postmodern or self-conscious style in which the writer's chief, if unstated, concern is to escape being convicted of philosophical naivete about his own enterprise. <laughs> they elaborate. When we open a cookbook, we completely put aside and expect the author to put aside the kind of question that leads to the heart of certain philosophical traditions. Is it possible to talk about cooking? <laughs> Do eggs really exist? <laughs> Is food something about which knowledge is possible? Can anyone ever tell us anything true about cooking? Classic style similarly puts aside as inappropriate philosophical questions about its enterprise. If it took those questions up, it could never get around to treating its subject, and its purpose is exclusively to treat its subject. 
Now, I would be defying the principles of classic style if I simply described it without presenting an example. So here's one. It comes from an article in Newsweek magazine by the physicist Brian Greene on the theory of inflationary cosmology. Greene writes, if space is now expanding, then at ever earlier times, the universe must have been ever smaller. At some moment in the distant past, everything we now see, the ingredients responsible for every planet, every star, every galaxy, even space itself, must have been compressed to an infinitesimal speck that then swelled outward, evolving into the universe as we know it. The Big Bang Theory was born. Yet scientists were aware that the Big Bang Theory suffered from a significant shortcoming. Of all things, it leaves out the bang. Einstein's equations do a wonderful job of describing how the universe evolved from a split second after the bang, but the equations break down, similar to the error message returned by a calculator when you try to divide one by zero, when applied to the extreme environment of the universe's earliest moment. The Big Bang thus provides no insight into what might have powered the bang itself. Now, in this passage, Green uh, reviews some pretty uh, complex physics and cosmology, but he does it in a way that the reader can see for himself or herself. If we are familiar with the idea that the universe is expanding, we can play the mental movie backward and see that it must have originated in an infinitesimal spec. And even the abstruse mathematical concept of equations breaking down, Green explains uh, in a way that allows anyone to see. We can either literally pull out a calculator and divide one by zero, and you'll see that the calculator will say error on it. Or you could even wrap your mind around what it could possibly mean to divide the number one into zero parts uh, to appreciate this concept. That's classic style. Now, many examples of writing advice turn out to be implications of the model behind classic prose. To start with, in classic prose, the focus is on the thing being shown, not on the activity of studying it. Uh, here's an example of the kind of uh, prose that I, as an academic, have to read every day. Uh, I, it's a uh, uh, made up, but it is all too typical of um, this would be an introduction to a review, a review article in the field that uh, I myself study. In recent years, an increasing number of researchers have turned their attention to the problem of child language acquisition. In this article, recent theories of this process will be reviewed. Well, no offense, but not a whole lot of people are all that fascinated by how professors spend their time. A more classic way of introducing the very same article could have been, all children acquire the ability to speak and understand a language without explicit lessons. How did they accomplish this feat? Uh, now this uh, bad habit, which I think of as professional narcissism, is not just a, uh, an affliction of academics. You can also see it in the news media, which very often cover the coverage, giving rise to the notorious media echo chamber. Many uh, articles on movies and popular music will tell you what the first weekend gross receipts were or the number of week, weeks on the charts, but say nothing about the work of art itself. Museum displays will often have a uh, uh, minute classification of uh, pottery styles and tell you how the shard in the showcase fits into one style uh, or another without saying anything about the people who uh, made the, the uh, pottery or why they made it. And uh, government and business websites are often organized around the bureaucratic uh, divisions of the uh, agency or company, rather than showing you uh, what you want to find. A corollary of uh, this uh, imperative is to minimize the kind of apologizing that is uh, uh, ubiquitous in academic writing. Here again is a, uh, a, a made up but all too realistic passage of prose of the kind that I read all the time. The problem of language acquisition is extremely complex. It is difficult to give precise definitions of the concept of language and the concept of acquisition and the concept of children. <laughs> there is much uncertainty about the interpretation of experimental data and a great deal of controversy surrounding the theories. More research needs to be done. <laughs> well, this is the kind of verbiage that could be deleted uh, in a stroke with no loss of content because classic prose gives the reader credit for knowing that many concepts are hard to define and many controversies are hard to resolve. The reader is there to see what the writer is going to do about it. <laughs> a second uh, 
implication of classic prose is that uh, it keeps up the illusion that the reader is seeing a wor world rather than listening to verbiage. And as such, classic prose avoids cliches like the plague. <laughs> we are all familiar with the uh, kind of writer who dispenses prose such as the following. We needed to think outside the box in our search for the Holy Grail, but found that it was neither a magic bullet nor a slam dunk. So we rolled with the punches and let the chips fall where they may while seeing the glass is half full. It's a no-brainer. <laughs> the uh, problem in writing with, uh, the problem with writing in cliches is that uh, it either forces the reader to just turn off her visual brain altogether and just process the language as blah, 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 blah. Or if um, she does uh, make the effort to visualize what the writing is actually referring to, she'll inevitably be upended by the mixed metaphors. Uh, as in this from a letter of recommendation I received, Jeff is a Renaissance man drilling down to the core issues and pushing the envelope. It's really not clear how you can do all three of those at the same time. <laughs> Uh, or this passage from a, uh, quoting some, uh, which I uh, read in the New York Times, uh, no one has yet invented a condom that will knock people's socks off. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you pay uh, insufficient attention to the meaning of your words, you might be eligible for membership in awful Americans who figuratively use literally. <laughs> Now, it's perfectly fine to say she literally blushed, but it's uh, much worse to say she literally exploded. <laughs> and it's very, very bad to write, uh, she literally emasculated him. <laughs> Third, classic prose is about the world. It's not about the conceptual tools with which we understand the world. And as such, it minimizes the use of meta-concepts. That is, concepts about concepts, such as approach, assumption, concept, condition, context, framework, issue level, model, paradigm, perspective, process, role, strategy, tendency, and variable. And uh, admit it, if any of you are in the university, uh, or, for, or a government, or a corporation, you probably use these words a lot. Uh, example from a, an op-ed in the New York Times by a legal scholar, I have serious doubts that trying to amend the Constitution would work on an actual level. On the aspirational level, however, a constitutional amendment strategy may be more valuable, uh, which could just as um, uh, easily be expressed as, I doubt that trying to amend the Constitution would actually succeed, but it may be valuable to aspire to it. Or this from an email I got, it is important to approach this subject from a variety of strategies, including mental health assistance, but also from a law enforcement perspective. Translation, uh, we should consult a psychiatrist about this man, but we may also have to inform the police. <laughs> Fourth, classic prose narrates ongoing events. We see agents performing actions that affect objects. Non-classic prose thingifies events and then refers to the uh, thing using a dangerous tool of English grammar called nominalization, making something into a noun. So instead of uh, appearing, I make an appearance. Instead of organizing this event, someone brings about the organization of this event. The literary scholar Helen Sword calls them zombie nouns because they kind of lumber across the scene with no conscious agent directing the action. And they can turn prose into a night of the living dead. Uh, example, participants read assertions whose veracity was either affirmed or denied by the subsequent presentation of an assessment word, uh, which is to say the people saw sentences each followed by the word true or false. <laughs> Subjects were tested under conditions of good to excellent acoustic isolation. Uh, to wit, we tested the students in a quiet room. <laughs> But it's not just academics who write in zombie prose. It is also politicians. When the uh, Republican National Convention was threatened by a hurricane a couple of years ago, Florida Governor Rick Scott said, right now there is not any anticipation there will be a cancellation. That is, right now we don't anticipate that we will have to cancel it. But just to be nonpartisan, here is uh, an example from the uh, other 
major political party. John Kerry, during the Mideast peace negotiations, said, the president is desirous of trying to see how we can make our best efforts in order to find a way to facilitate, which is to say, the president wants to help. <laughs> and corporate consultants, a young man uh, profiled by a, a journalist when asked what he did for a living, he said, I am a digital and social media strategist. I deliver programs, products, and strategies to our corporate clients across the spectrum of communications functions. When the journalist pressed him into what he really did, he finally broke down and he said, I teach big companies how to use Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and product engineers. Combustion heaters and portable generators used to carry the uh, uh, warning that was worded uh, as follows. Mild exposure to CO can result in accumulated damage over time. Extreme exposure to CO may rapidly be fatal without producing significant warning symptoms. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, and as a result, every year, several hundred Americans uh, turned their houses into gas chambers and asphyxiated themselves and their children by running uh, uh, combustion heaters or portable generators indoors. Until they changed the wording of the warning, so now it reads, Using a generator indoors can kill you in minutes. <laughs> so classic prose can literally be a matter of life and death. Yes, literally. <laughs> Part two, how can, how can an understanding of the design of language lead to better writing advice? Another contributor to zombie prose is the passive voice. This refers to the distinction between a sentence like the dog bit the man, a sentence in the active voice, and the man was bitten by the dog, a sentence in the passive voice. It's well known that the passive voice is overused by academics, as in, on the basis of the analysis which was made of the data which were collected, it is suggested that the null hypothesis can be rejected. Uh, and lawyers, the, if the outstanding balance is prepaid in full, the unearned finance charge will be refunded. Three passives in one sentence. <laughs> Uh, and politicians. Here we have a uh, New Jersey governor and Republican presidential candidate Chris Christie explaining uh, how it was that his uh, administration uh, deliberately caused a um, massive traffic jam uh, in order to punish a local mayor who did not support his bid for re-election. And uh, he said, mistakes were made. <laughs> the notorious politician's evasive passive. Well. As a, uh, not surprisingly, all the traditional manuals steer readers away from the passive voice. Strunk and White, for example, say, use the active voice. The active voice is usually more direct and vigorous than the passive. Many a tame sentence can be made lively and emphatic by substituting a transitive in the active voice for some such perfunctory expression as there is or could be heard. Well, I see, heard some scattered titters of uh, people who probably were educated before the 1970s, uh, indicating that you see that, yes, Strunk and White use the passive voice to tell people not to use the passive voice. Well, there's another uh, uh, iconic bit of advice on writing it is um, George Orwell's famous essay, Politics in the English Language, also assigned to every uh, freshman in a composition class. And Orwell, too, writes, um, a mixture of vagueness and sheer incompetence is the most marked characteristic of modern English prose. This is from 1946, by the way, again showing that some things don't change. I list below various of the tricks by means of which the work of prose construction is habitually dodged. The passive voice is wherever possible used in preference to the active, a passage that has not one, but two uses of the passive voice to tell readers not to, writers not to use the passive voice. Well, what's going on? Now, the passive voice could not have survived in the English language for 1,500 years if it did not serve such purpose. Why can't we do without it, even in trying to, to tell people not to use the passive voice? It comes down to the design of language. You can think of language as a, an app for converting a web of thoughts into a string of words. The writer's knowledge can be thought of uh, as a kind of mind-wide web, or what cognitive psychologists call a semantic network. For example, here is a fragment of a semantic network that captures a person's knowledge of the uh, tragic story brought to life by uh, Sophocles in his immortal play, Oedipus Rex. 
Uh, it has a number of nodes which stand for concepts like uh, Oedipus, Laius, Kill, Story, Theory, Father, Mother, and so on. And there are a bunch of links that connect the various nodes like doer, done to, uh, about, event, and so on. Now, as you're just pondering a, uh, the gist or meaning of the story of Oedipus Rex, you can start with any idea and your mind can surf from idea to idea in any direction, uh, kind of like following link links on the web. But now, what happens when it's, you have to put your thoughts down uh, on paper or on the screen? You have to use sentences. What is a sentence but a linear string of words? In Sophocles' play, Oedipus married his mother and killed his father. That means that there's an inherent problem that's baked into the design of language. The order of words in a sentence has to do two things at once. On the one hand, it serves as a code for meaning. That is, who did what to whom. On the other hand, it necessarily presents some bits of information to the reader before others, and thereby affects how the information is absorbed. In particular, early material in a sentence will naturally connect back with what's already reverberating in the reader's mind from the preceding context, and so the early material in the sentence is uh, the best place to express the topic, what the sentence is about. Uh, in the metaphor behind classic style, what the, the reader is looking at. The later material in the sentence uh, contains the sentence's focal point, uh, what the reader should now notice. And any prose that violates these principles, even if it is perfectly clear and well-formed as a sentence, will give rise to uh, prose that feels um, choppy or disjointed or incoherent. And that brings us back to the passive. The passive voice is a workaround for this problem. Uh, it allows writers to convey the same ideas, namely uh, who did what to whom, while varying the order of mention in the uh, context. In particular, the passive allows a writer to start with the done to or acted upon rather than the doer or the actor. And that's why avoid the passive is not just bad advice, uh, it's impossible advice. Even the experts who offer it were unable to stick with their own uh, commandment. In fact, the passive is the better construction when the done to or the acted upon is currently the target of the reader's mental gaze. And again, I'll give you an example. This is a passage that comes from the Wikipedia entry for Oedipus Rex, and it explains the pivotal uh, scene in the play in which the tragic backstory is brought to light. So, spoiler alert. <laughs> a messenger arrives from Corinth. It emerges that he was formerly a shepherd on Mount Kitheron, and during that time he was given a baby. The baby, he says, was given to him by another shepherd from the Laius household who had been told to get rid of the child. Now, this passage has three passives set in a row, uh, and for good reason. Um, as the uh, passage opens, all eyes are on the messenger, and so the next sentence ought to begin with a mention of the messenger, and thanks to the passive voice, so it does. He was given a baby. Well, now we're all looking at the baby, and so the next sentence ought to begin with the baby, and thanks to the passive voice, so it does. The baby was given to the messenger by another shepherd. Well, now another shepherd has walked onto our mental stage. We're all looking at this other shepherd, and the next sentence ought to begin with him, and again, thanks to the passive voice, the anonymous Wikipedia writer uh, was able to do that. The other shepherd had been told to get rid of the child. Now, imagine that some uh, copy editor Strunk and White in hand, had uh, gone over this prose and uh, converted all of the passives into actives. And there are such copy editors in the world. I was uh, once saddled with one. <laughs> Here's how it would read. Uh, a messenger arrives from Corinth. It emerges that he was formerly a shepherd on Mount Kitheron, and during that time, someone gave him a baby. Another shepherd from the Laius household, he says, whom someone had told to get rid of a child, gave the baby to him. Now, I think you'll have to agree that this is not an improvement. Uh, our uh, gaze is kind of jerked back and forth from one character to another. Protagonists kind of parachute onto the stage uh, with no warning. Uh, and that's the judicious use of the passive voice can avoid that. More generally, English syntax provides writers with constructions that vary order in the string while preserving meaning. 
Oedipus killed Laius, Laius was killed by Oedipus, it was Laius whom Oedipus killed, it was Oedipus who killed Laius, and so on, and writers must choose the construction that introduces ideas to the reader in the order in which uh, she can absorb them. Well, that brings us back to the original question, why is the passive so common in bad writing? It's because good writers narrate a story advanced by protagonists who make things happen. Bad writers work backwards from their own knowledge, write, writing down ideas in the order in which they occur to them. They know how the story turns out, so they begin with the outcome, and then they throw in the cause as an afterthought, and the passive makes that all too easy. Part three, why should this be so hard? Why is it so hard for writers to use the resources of language to convey ideas effectively? The best explanation that I, I know of uh, is a phenomenon that goes by many names, but my favorite is the curse of knowledge. The fact that when you know something, it's extraordinarily hard to imagine what it's like for someone else not to know it. It, the, this phenomenon has uh, been studied extensively by psychologists. It's also called mind blindness, egocentrism, and the hindsight bias. And a uh, simple explanation comes from a classic uh, study in child psychology called the M&M study. And here's how it works. A three -year, bring a three-year-old boy into the lab. He sits down at a little children's chair. Uh, with a table, and the experimenter puts a box of M&Ms on the uh, table and invites the boy to open it. So he opens it up, and he's surprised to find that instead of uh, M&Ms, it's got uh, ribbons. Um, and so you, the experimenter puts the ribbons back in the box, closes it up, puts it back on the table, says to the boy, well, now another little boy is going to come into the room, Jason. What does Jason think is in the box? And the, the boy will say, ribbons, even though Jason has no way of knowing, as the little boy himself could not have known, that the box uh, does not contain candies. But now that the boy knows it, he can't imagine anyone else not knowing it. In fact, if you ask him, well, what did you think was in the box when you came into the lab? And he'll say, ribbons. Uh, <laughs> that is, he can no longer reconstruct the state prior to knowing what he now knows. Now, adults, uh, of course, overcome this limitation. Kinda, <laughs> sort of, ish. Because uh, many studies have shown that adults too are uh, uh, victims of this uh, infirmity. Uh, if someone knows an uh, obscure word, they just assume that everyone knows it. If uh, someone knows a, uh, an arcane bit of factual knowledge, they assume it's common knowledge. Uh, and in one study, the more experience a person had with a uh, complicated gadget, like a smartphone, the less time they estimated it would take other people to learn it, because it's just so obvious to them. Uh, I think the curse of knowledge is the chief contributor to opaque writing. It simply doesn't occur to the writer that readers haven't learned their jargon, don't know the intermediate steps that to them seem too obvious to mention, can't visualize a scene that's currently in the writer's mind's eye. And so the writer doesn't bother to explain the jargon or spell out the logic or supply the concrete details, even when writing for professional peers. There's a lazy excuse that uh, writers often will uh, provide. Well, I'm writing for people who know what uh, I know, so it would be uh, tedious to have to explain everything every time. Surely everyone else knows it. And the answer all too often is, no, they don't. I'll give you an example. This is from a journal called Trends in Cognitive Science, which is uh, designed, contains short, non-technical articles allowing researchers in cognitive science to keep up with each other's work. And it's from an article on the science of consciousness. The slow and integrative nature of conscious perception is confirmed behaviorally by observations such as the rabbit illusion and its variants, where the way in which a stimulus is ultimately perceived is influenced by post-stimulus events arising several hundreds of milliseconds after the original stimulus. Now, I've been in this business for decades, and I have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, for one thing, I know a lot of illusions, but I've never heard of the rabbit illusion. I know what the word stimulus means, but I have no idea what they mean by the way in which a stimulus is ultimately perceived. So I went to my books and I discovered there is uh, a cutaneous rabbit illusion that works as follows. A person comes into the lab, he, they close their eyes, they stick out their arm, 
the experimenter taps them three times on the wrist, three times on the elbow, and three times on the shoulder. And it feels to them like a series of taps running up the length of their arm, kind of like a hopping rabbit, hence the rabbit illusion. So why, why didn't they just say that? Uh, not only is it no more scientific to talk about the rabbit illusion and the way a stimulus is ultimately perceived, it's actually much less scientific. Because now that I, the reader, know what the rabbit illusion is, I can follow the logic. Namely, uh, it shows that consciousness does not track events in real time, but our brain is constantly editing our experiences retrospectively and massaging them into a coherent uh, percept, or so, is the, is the, uh, so the argument goes. Uh, well, knowing that, I can then uh, appreciate the logic and perhaps even dispute it, something that I can't do if they just refer to stimulus this and post-stimulus that. My favorite reminder of the hazards of uh, excessive uh, and thoughtless abbreviation comes from an old joke. So a man is uh, staying at a Catskills resort, and he goes into the dining room. And what does he see but a bunch of retired borscht belt comedians uh, sitting around a table. So there's an empty seat, and he joins them. And uh, one of the comedians shouts out, 37. And the others uh, break out into uproarious laughter. Another one says, 71. And again, just peals of laughter. They're just falling on, off their chairs. Uh, and he can't figure out what's going on. So he asks the guy next to him, he says, what's happening here? The guy says, well, these old timers, they've been around each other for so long that they all know the same jokes. So to save time, they've given each joke a number. <laughs> now they just have to recite the number. The guy says, that's ingenious. Uh, so he tries it himself. 44. Stony silence. 61. Everyone stares at him. No one laughs. So he sinks back down to a seat and he asks his companion, what happened? What, what did I do wrong? The guy says, uh, it's all in the way you tell it. <laughs> Uh, how do you exercise the curse of knowledge? Well, the traditional solution is always keep in mind the reader over your shoulder. That is, empathize with your poor reader, feel his pain, uh, walk a mile in his moccasins, try to see the world from his point of view. This is good advice as far as it goes, but it doesn't really go far enough because many experiments in psychology show that we don't get a whole lot better at figuring out what's in people's minds just by trying really, really hard. Um, better uh, solution is to actually get a representative reader and show them a draft. You'll often be surprised to find that what's obvious to you isn't obvious to anyone else. Or even allow some uh, time to pass so that the writing is no longer familiar to you and show a draft to yourself. Uh, if you're like me, you'll often find yourself saying, hmm, that doesn't follow, or I wonder what I meant by that, or all too often, who wrote this crap? <laughs> uh, and then rewrite several times with a single goal, making the prose more understandable to the reader. Finally, how should we think about correct usage? The aspect of writing that by far attracts the most attention and the most emotion. Now, some usages are clearly <coughs> wrong. When Cookie Monster says, me want cookie, even a small child will laugh because the small child knows that Cookie Monster has made a grammatical error. Likewise, I can has cheeseburger. The humor in lolcats, such as it is, uh, depends on our feeling of superiority over cats <laughs> who have not mastered the grammar of the English language. Is our children learning? <laughs> Even former President George W. Bush admitted that this was a grammatical error in a self-deprecating speech he gave in which he went over a number of his uh, uh, misuses of the English language. Uh, other uh, 
usage errors are not so clear. And again, just to be nonpartisan, I'll give you an example from a Democratic president. When Bill Clinton was running for the presidency, one of his campaign slogans was, give Al Gore and I a chance to bring America back. Well, he almost lost the vote of the English teachers uh, because he committed the infamous between you and I error. They uh, insisted that it should be give Al Gore and me a chance to bring America back. Another Democratic president, uh, Barack Obama said, no American should live under a cloud of suspicion just because of what they look like. The singular they era, error. <laughs> to boldly go where no man has gone before, yeah. Captain Kirk split an infinitive. <laughs> now for you youngsters, the Beatles. <laughs> you think you lost your love? Well, I saw her yesterday, eh? It's you she's thinking of, and she told me what to say. Anyone spot the alleged grammatical error there? Mm -hmm. Ending a sentence with a preposition. And uh, some of you uh, may recall the suave, urbane, articulate talk show host Dick Cavett. Uh, in a um, recent essay in the New York Times, he was describing his college reunion. And he wrote, checking into the hotel, it was nice to see a few of my old classmates in the lobby. Anyone educated in the 1960s or before? Dangling participle. So disputed usages like this have given rise to what journalists sometimes call the language war, which on the one hand, we have the prescriptivists, those who prescribe how people ought to speak and write also known as the purists, sticklers, pedants, peevers, snobs, snoots, nitpickers, traditionalists, language police, usage nannies, grammar Nazis, and the gotcha gang, <laughs> according to whom rules of usage are objectively correct. To obey them is to uphold standards of excellence. To flout them is to dumb down literate culture, degrade the language, and hasten the decline of civilization. <laughs> On the other side, according to this uh, scenario, we have the descriptivists who describe how people do speak and white, write, according to whom rules of usage are just the secret handshake of the ruling class and the people should be liberated to write however they please. Now, uh, my own view is that the so-called language war is a pseudo-controversy, that if it were really uh, accurate, you would have prescriptivists insisting that the lyrics to the Beatles song should have been, it's you of whom she's thinking. And the descriptivist would have to say that there is nothing wrong with I can has cheeseburger, which would, of course, undermine the whole point of lolcats. I think we need a more sophisticated way of thinking about usage. So what are rules of usage? They are obviously not logical truths that you could uh, prove uh, in a uh, formal proof, nor are they officially regulated by dictionaries uh, the way the rules of Major League Baseball are legislated by a rules committee. And I can speak with some authority here because I uh, am the chair of the usage panel of the American Heritage Dictionary. And uh, when I was uh, brought, brought aboard, the first question I asked the editor-in-chief is, how do you guys decide what goes into the dictionary? Uh, many people think that dictionary editors sit around a table and they decide what's correct or what's incorrect. But his answer was, we pay attention to the way people use words. That is, when it comes to what's correct and incorrect, there's no one in charge. The lunatics are running the asylum. <laughs> so what are rules of usage? They are best thought of as tacit evolving conventions. A convention is a way of doing th something that has no inherent merit other than the fact that everyone else is doing it. Paper currency is an example. There's nothing valuable about a green piece of paper with a president on it, except for the fact that everyone else agrees to treat it as valuable. Or driving on the right as opposed to the left. Uh, in England, they get along perfectly well driving on the left. Uh, there's no advantage to doing it one way or another, but there is an advantage to everyone doing it the same way, whichever it is. Uh, the conventions of language, however, unlike traffic laws, are tacit. They emerge as a rough consensus within a community of careful writers without explicit deliberation, agreement, or legislation. And they're evolving. The consensus may change over time, as we saw with the, uh, at one 
time neologisms to contact and to, finalism, to finalize, which have become completely unexceptionable. So should writers follow the rules? The answer is, it depends. Some rules just extend the logic of everyday grammar to more complicated cases. So let's take George W. Bush's uh, admitted error, is our children learning? Uh, everyone, including the former president, agrees that this is a grammatical error when they think about it. Even the infamous Microsoft Word grammar checker flagged this with the green wiggly line. Why? Well, is our children learning is just a rearrangement of our children is learning, and uh, everyone agrees that our children is learning is uh, ungrammatical. Here's a slightly more subtle one. The impact of the cuts have not been felt yet. Again, Microsoft Word's grammar checker noticed the grammatical error. It may have uh, slipped by your eyes. But when you think about it, the subject of the sentence is not cuts, but impact. It's the impact uh, which is uh, not felt. And you would never say the impact have not been felt yet. That just jumps off the page as a grammatical error. And so the impact of the cuts have not been felt is also no, a grammatical error. The writer here was uh, distracted by the presence of the plural noun cuts, cheek by jowl with have, and so momentarily distracted, chose the wrong version of the verb uh, to have. Also, some rules of correct usage make important semantic distinctions. The word fulsome is not a fancy schmancy synonym for full, and you should not thank someone for the fulsome praise they just gave you. Fulsome does not mean full, it means uh, unctuous, insincere, uh, excessive, uh, uh, dishonestly designed to flatter. Likewise, you should not compliment someone for their simplistic theory. If what you mean is that the theory is simple, simplistic uh, means uh, naive or childlike or overly simple. And if you think that someone is uh, full of merit, you can call them meritorious. Do not call them meretricious. Uh, look it up if you don't know why. If you uh, carelessly use hoity-toity synonyms of a familiar word without knowing uh, how they will be understood, you are likely to elicit the same reaction that the character uh, Vizzini did in The Princess Bride when he kept referring to things that just happened by saying inconceivable. Namely, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> At the same time, not every pet peeve, bit of grammatical folklore, or dimly remembered lesson from Miss Thistlebottom's classroom is a legitimate rule of usage. And in fact, many supposed rules of usage turn out to violate the grammatical logic of English uh, are routinely flouted by the best writers and have always been flouted by the best writers. Singular they, uh, as in Obama's uh, declaration, is a good example. A few years ago, a purist wrote an uh, irate article in the Weekly Standard claiming that singular they was a uh, mangling of the language shoved down our throat by radical feminists in search of a gender neutral uh, pronoun that we should resist this mutilation and uh, go back to the uh, pure crystalline prose of Jane Austen. Whoops. Turns out that Jane Austen used singular they 87 times in her uh, novels, such as everybody began to have their vexation. And if you got a problem with a preposition at the end of the sentence, maybe you should uh, argue with William Shakespeare, uh, who wrote, we are such stuff as dreams are made on. And the same is true of split infinitives, dangling participles between you and I, and a number of others. In fact, obeying these bogus rules can make prose worse. Here is a sentence that I received in a press release from my employer. David Rockefeller has pledged $100 million to increase dramatically learning opportunities for Harvard <laughs> undergraduates. Now, <clears throat> this hack twisted himself into such a pretzel to avoid a split infinitive that he came up with to increase dramatically learning opportunities, a word sequence that uh, I would argue is not even part of the English language. <laughs> <clears throat> Indeed, uh, obeying bogus rules can literally uh, trigger a crisis in governance. Literally. In 2009, uh, 
Barack Obama was sworn in as President of the United States. This was the responsibility of the Chief Justice, John Roberts, who is famous as a grammatical stickler. Now, according to the Constitution, the wording of the oath of office uh, includes the sentence, I, Barack Obama, do sol solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. But um, Chief Justice Roberts thought he spotted a grammatical error, a split verb in will faithfully execute. And so he abandoned his strict constructionism, unilaterally uh, amended the Constitution, and asked uh, Mr. Obama to recite the words, I, Barack Obama, do solemnly swear that I will execute the office of President of the United States faithfully. Now, not only is this not a stylistic improvement, but it called into question the legitimacy of the transfer of power. <laughs> if you think the uh, birthers are bad now, imagine what would have happened if uh, Obama had never been sworn in according to the words stipulated by the Constitution. And so just to rule that out, they repeated the ceremony, uh, the oath in a private ceremony in the Oval Office later that afternoon. So how should a careful writer distinguish the legitimate rules of usage from the bogus ones? Well, the answer is unbelievably simple. Look them up. If you look up split infinitive in Merriam-Webster's Unabridged Dictionary, it will say, it's all right to split an infinitive in the interest of clarity. Since clarity is the usual reason for splitting, this advice means merely that you can split them whenever you want to. <laughs> in Carta, there is no grammatical basis for rejecting split infinitives. American Heritage Dictionary, Random House Dictionary, there is not a single dictionary out there that will tell you that there's anything wrong with splitting an infinitive. Modern dictionaries and style manuals do not ratify pet peeves, grammatical folklore, or bogus uh, rules. If you use them to settle, if you're a purist and use them to settle a barroom bet, you will lose. Uh, and that's because they base their advice on evidence, on the practices of contemporary good writers, on the practices of the best writers in the past, on uh, polling data from a panel of contemporary writers for contested cases. This is the panel that I chair at the American Heritage Dictionary, on the effects of, on clarity, and on consistency with the grammatical logic of English. Also, correct usage should be kept in perspective. Uh, although I think that the legitimate rules of usage are well worth following, they are the least important part of good writing. They pale in significance behind maintaining classic style, coherent ordering of ideas, overcoming the curse of knowledge, to say nothing of factual diligence and sound argumentation. And even the most irksome errors are not, in fact, signs of the decline of the language, a point uh, well illustrated by the cartoonist Randall Monroe in his XKCD strip, in which uh, he shows a, a purist being uh, awakened in the wee hours of the night by a ghost who brings him a cautionary vision of things to come. This is the future. And this is the future if you give up the fight over the word literally. <laughs> and as you can see, they are exactly the same. So to sum up, I've suggested that modern linguistics and cognitive science provide better ways of enhancing our writing a model of prose communication, namely classic style in which language is a window onto the world, an understanding of the way language works, in particular the way it converts a web of thoughts into a string of words, a diagnosis of why good prose is so hard to write, namely the curse of knowledge, and a way to make sense of the rules of correct usage, namely as tacit evolving conventions. Thank you very much. And uh, now um, I'm happy to answer questions. I've been asked to uh, direct the questioners to the microphone in the aisle in the center of the room, please. Hello. Um, you mentioned the number of um, things having to do with the web and what the impact might be degrading the language and so forth. And I agree with much of what you said, but I 
wonder sometimes if um, on some level other than sentence structure or certain kinds of usage, um, in terms of developing thought, it does kind of degrade it. I mean, sometimes I get the sense that people think in terms of post-it note sized bits and they think that bigger pieces of argument are just many more post-it sized bits and of course they're not and also in terms of punctuation sometimes people use say in emails um, ellipsis but they're being lazy about connecting the idea what's the relationship between the idea instead because of the rush associated with the web it's okay to just put three dots there and not really explain what the relationship is to the things on either side yeah um, I, I know this is, it's a um a common observation, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm I guess I'm uh, skeptical because there are now and always have been many f uh, media of communication, each of which imposes different demands. Uh, in the past, there were telegrams, for example, when they charged by the word, people would leave out the articles and the prepositions when composing a telegram, but the English language hasn't lost the articles and prepositions. People knew that's what you do in a telegram, but it isn't what you do in a sermon or an op-ed or, or a review or an encyclopedia article and so on. And so uh, today there are, as the, there's a different menu of media by which we express ourselves. There are, there are texts, there's email, but there's still, uh, books still come out. This building's full of them. Uh, uh, there, there are um, uh, newspaper and magazine articles of uh, every length. Um, and. Uh, in cases where there really is a premium on uh, rapidity, such as when you're texting someone about a, a rendezvous, uh, it really doesn't matter if there are punctuation errors, as long as you know how to use them in those forums in which uh, uh, it's called for. Namely, if you're writing edited prose, if you're submitting a term paper, if you're uh, uh, write, trying to uh, get a letter to the editor published in a paper, then you really ought to know the, the rules of uh, punctuation. And there's not much evidence that today's students are any worse uh, than, or users of the web are any worse than all the people that those quotes that I mentioned were complaining about in past decades. Namely, the rules, and I go over the rules of punctuation in, in the sense of style. Um, the errors are actually pretty natural because uh, a lot of our rules of punctuation are completely illogical. They are, uh, if anyone proposed them now, they would be shot down because they make no sense. But still, they're kind of the legacy. We're kind of stuck with them. Uh, and um, they're, they're hard. People will make errors unless they uh, uh, pay attention to them. And, uh, um, uh, and so the errors are really, um, in, in any medium, not, not surprising. Uh, but studies of the quality of student term papers over the decades has shown that there has not been a uh, decline and that students today are not submitting term papers that look like text messages or, or uh, emails. They have a good sense that you don't, you know, you, what you can get away with in a text message, you can't get away with when you submit a term paper. Hello, um, thanks for being here. Uh, I understand that you were brought here at least in part by the nonfiction department and so I understand that for the most part your talk dealt with nonfiction and um, and I know that nonfiction is constantly striving for clarity so my question to you is uh, what do you see as the differences in fiction because sometimes fiction uh, strives to be unclear in a certain way to provoke thought and an ultimate kind of like clarity yeah so no, it, it, yes, that is a good point. I think there is, um, the book is aimed primarily at nonfiction, although there is a lot of overlap between fiction and nonfiction, and even for that matter between nonfiction and poetry, uh, that uh, a number of poetic uh, devices such as alliteration uh, and uh, rhythm are highly useful even in, uh, in uh, technical prose. And uh, conversely, so many of the principles of classic style are applicable, at least to certain kinds of fiction writing. Uh, one of the first bits of advice that a fiction writer is given is uh, show, don't tell. That is, don't say, 
he pulled up to a shabby house. Say he pulled up to a house where the rusty chain link fence was hanging off one hinge and a pink flamingo was uh, <laughs> stuck in the yard and so on. And that's very similar to the advice that I would offer any academic of don't talk about the context and the level and the perspective uh, but, or the stimulus or, or, uh, or even the rabbit illusion, but say what's going on. So, uh, so I think there's more overlap than, than uh, people often uh, recognize. Uh, that having been said, classic prose is one kind of model uh, of, of um, uh, mindset or scenario that a writer can keep in mind, but often a creative writer will deliberately choose an alternative. I mean, the most obvious example is in um, stream of consciousness, such as the, uh, uh, the famous ending of, uh, of Ulysses, where it's not punctuated, it's not grammatical, because the whole point was to do the opposite of, of classic style. Namely, the writer in, in that case is not giving the reader a, uh, a view of objective reality, but trying to let the reader eavesdrop on the uh, rush of thoughts and uh, feelings and images. And for that, of course, you deploy the resources of language in a completely different way. The, the, the reason that, uh, it would be you know, ridiculous to say James Joyce was a bad writer because he didn't obey the precepts of classic style, is that he was deliber deliberately trying not to adopt the model of classic style. He knew what he was doing. He was deploying the resources of language in order to accomplish a goal that was clear in his mind. And so really a, a, a more general uh, lesson would be not so much you always have to apply classic style, sometimes you don't, but just know what you're doing. Know what you're tr how you're imagining the reader, what you're trying to accomplish, and tailor the language to accomplish that. Classic style is often a good way to, to do it, but it is not the only style. <coughs> yep, you, but uh, you, we've been asked to have you go, go to the microphone. This is being uh, broadcasted and uh, I presume recorded for posterity. If, whether posterity, posterity is interested is another, is another matter. Uh, so, so I have a question about credibility. Um, if 20% of the people in this room object to the word finalize, or they, or them as a singular, aren't people risking an awful lot if they use those words? If 20% or maybe more um, uh, actually mm -hmm. feel like uh, you're scratching them across your eyes yeah. uh, by, by using those words. And so, so uh, in academe and everywhere, you want to appear as an intelligent, credible, uh, educated, cultured human being. And if you're going to lose 20% of yeah. your audience, um, th that sounds like a dicey proposition. Yes. No, I think that's a, that's a valid point, although it, it cuts both ways. That if you, um, that is, if you insist on a purist usage that no one under the age of 80 respects, just because that's the way they used to do it, then you'll lose those readers too, uh, for the opposite reason. So for, just to give you an example, there is an old rule that says that uh, the word nauseous uh, may only be used to mean um, uh, nauseating, not nauseated. So you can say that you know, spatter film was really nauseous. Uh, you will satisfy Miss Thistlebottom and the uh, purists of a certain era, but no one will know what you're talking about <laughs> because now, because uh, there's been a tipping point, and now nauseous means nauseated. Uh, so in the, this is the rationale behind the usage panel at the American Heritage Dictionary, where we actually do poll careful writers, and in cases, you know, in many cases. If there's a consensus or a near consensus, more than 85% you know, of the writers say, uh, I would never use it, then you're right. You'd be well advised not to use it because it will grate on the ears of the kind of audience you want to uh, reach in formal settings. Um, in other cases, uh, even the experts disagree. Uh, and, uh, or it, it, it can shift from, we, we often keep track of how the opinions change. And going back to the 60s is often surprising to see what uh, got under the skin of careful writers back then that everyone has totally forgotten about, like uh, Michael and Lisa uh, divorced last year. That was, that is using divorced in a um, reciprocal intransitive construction, instead of Lisa divorced Michael or Michael divorced Lisa, instead of using it transitively. 
that was considered a, a major usage controversy in the 1960s, and a majority of the panel uh, said it was uh, uh, you know, barbaric. Uh, now it's fine. Or balding. He was balding. Uh, that was an, an, when it was a neologism, it grated on people's ears. So yes, you should. Um, uh, the, the, and the reason that I, I mean, uh, I, I don't get paid for saying this, but uh, the reason that a dictionary is such a useful investment, especially ones that are uh, updated regularly, is they'll give you uh, a sense of what your readers will expect, and you would be well advised not to uh, uh, use expressions that, uh, that, that will, will turn them off. Thank you. Hi there, I'm a newspaper editor, um, among other things, and I'm fully balded, by the way. Um, so I would, and I very much enjoyed listening to you. I disagree with some of what you said, of course, as many people will. Do you, who edits you? Do you have an editor for your book? And what is that person's role in working with you? And how does that, uh, oh, yeah. how does that work? Well, I have an editor and I have a copy editor. A mm -hmm. uh, copy editor is one that I've, uh, who's worked with me on um, uh, eight of my ten books. Uh, after We got along so well after the first one that I kept asking that she be hired as a uh, mm -hmm. freelance at, uh, whenever she was available, Katya Rice. Uh, oh, yeah, I could, I, uh, everyone, um, uh, could, uh, could benefit from a judicious copy editor, which mm -hmm. Katya is and which many copy editors aren't. Uh, that is, anyone who um, mechanically applies rules from some old style manual is likely to make prose worse. Mm -hmm. uh, a good copy editor uh, is um, one who recognizes that language changes, that many of the uh, rules in the old style books are uh, bogus, um, that uh, clarity and grace uh, are uh, not the same as correct usage. So, um, you know, like, like anyone, I benefit from having a good copy editor. And again, if, you're, if, you, if, the, um, if, if you took away from uh, uh, this talk, as many editors do, that the rules of usage should just be blown off, then, uh, then uh, go back to the tape of this lecture and listen I, to it again. And I wouldn't be a very not, good editor, that's right. Because that's not what I, is, that is not what I said. I Although that's a common reaction, sure. which is what I've tried to argue against in every way that I can, but it still seems to uh, uh, land on deaf ears. Namely, the fact that some rules are bogus does not mean that all rules are, bo are bogus. That part I got. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I have a question that relates writing to reading, and it's a personal yeah. question about you. Do you have a filter that you can just pull out when you're reading something that's just so delightful or charming or, or exciting or sp suspenseful that you can suspend all this judgment about? Uh, do you mean... Uh, that you don't have to criticize the writing oh, while yes. you're enjoying what you're reading? Yes. Um, <laughs> You know, at, at, uh, depending on the uh, medium, depending on the person writing, uh, you know, I, I kind of calibrate my way of, of reading appropriately. And, and in fact, that goes, cuts both ways. Uh, I think writing, good writing begins in the ability to appreciate and savor good writing when you do see it. And so to, uh, I was chastened when I began writing the book, when I asked some good writers that I knew, know, uh, how, what style manuals they consulted when they started to hone their craft. And the most common answer I got was none. So I was like, what am I writing this for? Uh, uh, if, if you don't really need a manual in order to write better. And what, but what is universally true of good writers is they do a lot of reading. Uh, and uh, when they read, they know good writing when they see it. And I think they let it sink in and try to appreciate what makes that? Why am I enjoying this? Why is this good writing good? And, and as you reverse engineer good prose, uh, you, you, that's how you tune your ear to what is good writing. Uh, but, and, and conversely, I certainly don't sit in judgment of everyone who, uh, who writes to me. It's not like the, you know, I don't know if there are any English teachers uh, in this room, but you, you know that you, when someone asks you, you know, at a bar, what do you do for a living? You say, oh, I'm an English teacher. Oh, I better watch what I say. I might make a grammatical error. Uh, so that, that's not the way real English teachers are, and it's not the way I am either. Hi. Hi. Thank you for this lecture. Sure. Um, you mentioned the Robert Elogian, 
uh, as an example of that he, the author didn't uh, define that. But I think you can find it easily in Wikipedia or you can Google it. So do we have, if we want to write something, do we have to write a lot of margins? And uh, do you think that readers are lazy enough, lazy that they will not search for the things that they don't know? Uh, well, there is, uh, I mean, you raise a good point in that now it's easier than ever to look things up when you need to find them. But, you know, sometimes people are reading a hard copy in, a, uh, in a, uh, you know, at the beach or in the bathroom or uh, they're, they're in a plane and you've got to set everything to airplane mode uh, and, and in other cases. And, and uh, you, you need to, um, uh, while avoiding the curse of knowledge, anticipate what is a technical term that people will uh, <coughs> naturally know without having to um, follow a link or to exit that window and go to uh, Wikipedia you know, several times per sentence. So it is a matter of judgment. Uh, it's often best calibrated by showing people uh, work. In the future, more and more, as more and more text is online, it will be possible to insert links for uh, more obscure technical yeah. terms. Uh, but uh, e even then, uh, even if the rabbit illusion itself is um, something that you could look up, knowing how it fits into the argument, namely the way a stimulus is perceived, is something that is still much better to, uh, to spell out instead of having the reader read a paragraph for every phrase in your own prose. Uh, but that having been said, you're, you're certainly right that this is a, uh, there's a some amount of uh, look up of technical terms that a writer can uh, imagine a reader is doing as long as it's uh, not too excessive. Thank you. One more? Yep. Again, we'll ask you to go to the mic. Hi. So uh, my language is more ESL based. Um, uh, writing as a second language. Mm -hmm. I have given workshops of former gram grammatical teachers who are retired and now teaching ESL. And they tell me, well, I'm just going to teach them the right way first, and then they can learn how to write casually on their own. And I just wondered, what was your thought on that? Yeah, the, um, a few things. It's, uh, it's certainly true that you can't, uh, not even a uh, speaker and writer of English as a first language, can get everything uh, correct on paper the first time. It's just too much. It's just too demanding. Uh, and uh, you know, even after having written uh, ten books and a gazillion articles, I still find writing hard work. And uh, for someone who's struggling with the with English as a, a second language, to insist that they get everything right the first time, no, I haven't done it. But I'm guessing that it's probably not very effective as pedagogy. Uh, that is, uh, you, know, you have to learn the rudiments before the, the fine points. Um, but uh, uh, sort of saving some of the uh, more technical matters of punctuation and usage for after the basics have been mastered, and perhaps even better, um, inculcating the skill of looking things up when you don't know how to do them, so that uh, it isn't, not everything has to be in memory, I, I imagine would be helpful. Finally. I, I would think that explaining some of the uh, quirks and illogical aspects of the language and making it clear how illogical they are uh, might help in um, overcoming your tendency to just regularize everything and do everything logically or to port it over from your knowledge of the, of the first language. So those are just some offhand thoughts of, uh, of a, a task that I myself have uh, I've never done personally. Could you comment a little on the uh, attempts by the French government to regulate the usage of the French language? Is, is that still going on, and how is it working, and yes. uh, what there do you think a, of it? L'Académie la, Française, uh, which, uh, which indeed uh, tries to regulate the language, and in particular, uh, <clears throat> to keep out English loan words, like uh, you know, the software, it should be the logiciel, I believe, and com the computer, l'ordinateur. Uh, medium. I mean, certainly in government communications, you have no choice. You must, uh, in France, uh, obey the, the dictates of the French Academy. Uh, 
most of their rulings, though, are uh, gaily ignored by the uh, French-speaking public. <laughs> so it's, a, uh, uh, it's largely an exercise in, in futility, uh, uh, you know, except for, uh, for arenas where they can actually impose their will, such as in government documents. Do you mind if I just, just to ask a, a slight follow-up? Um, I, I, I agree with what you said, but uh, is there an argument for the Academy Francaise? You know, is, is there an argument for doing that? Uh, no. No. <laughs> yeah, no. It's, uh, you know, Sa Samuel Johnson famously was, uh, took it on himself to do that, to, uh, to try to police the English language in the uh, 18th century. And he started off as a purist and a, st and a stickler, and then he wrote a kind of lamentation. He, he's, he wrote one of the uh, first uh, and, and best to dictionaries of the English language. And he said, to enchain syllables uh, is, is like trying to lash the wind. Uh, it is, uh, I forget the exact quote now, fails to measure its desires by its strength. In other words, it, it, it is futile. You, the English language belongs to the hundreds of millions of people to speak it, to try to uh, uh, force them all to uh, speak in a one prescribed way would require powers um, you know, like, like Mao Zedong. Uh, it just, uh, in, a, in, a, in a free country, a free world, just no one has that power. And you, know, you, you really wouldn't want to because uh, as in the case of to contact and to finalize, uh, words that uh, just grate on the ear of uh, the purists in one generation may, to their chagrin and over their objections, become useful words in another generation. And, and it's very, uh, as in uh, excessive planning of any uh, spontaneous cooperative activity, a few experts are likely to be outperformed by a kind of crowdsourced wisdom. Uh, in terms of what makes the language expressive and poetic and so, and, uh, so on. Uh, and even the, um, okay, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> um, this dovetails sort of nicely with what you just said, but uh, I'm in a pro style class right now. In what class? I'm in a pro style class right now. And, uh, pro style, okay, yes. Yeah. And the first, the way we started the semester was talking about how usage and how we define correct usage relates to uh, prejudice power structures, who it gives opportunity and who it denies opportunity in terms of, of uh, race and what is considered dialects of English. And I was wondering if you could speak a little about that with your experience working for American Heritage and kind of how that gets dealt with. Yeah, that was uh, in the in the kind of prescriptivist descriptivist debate. This was uh, off. This position is often attributed and sometimes adopted by the by the descriptivists. Uh, I, I don't think there's. I don't think it's true. That is the. Um, if you if you want to look at who the, the, the guardians of correct English are, they tend not to be the you know the one percent. Uh, the prose quality of uh, corporate titans and um, uh, congressmen and uh, even certain presidents that we've had tend not to use correct English as a kind of a special membership badge. Uh, often the, the, the ones who are most attuned to correct usage are uh, people like um, uh, uh, English teachers and uh, journalists and um, linguists and other people who don't have a whole lot of power in this uh, society. <laughs> uh, so uh, there is certainly the uh, difference between the standard dialect uh, and the and alternative uh, dialects, rural and, and um, regional dialects. And it is worthwhile noting that many uh, uh, points of, of correct usage that are uh, alleged to be more logical, more consistent, like avoiding the double negative, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't see no police, or I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> Uh, which, are, which sometimes people will say are um, violations of logic and science of poor thinking. There, that really is turning class, uh, uh, class prejudice into a uh, fallacious um, stigmatization of, of, uh, of, the, of thought patterns because uh, many languages have a double negative. In fact, uh, I can't get any satisfaction itself has a double negative. Any is, is a negative word. Uh, and. Uh, uh, nor does I can't get no satisfaction 
mean um, I, I am satisfied, even even in, in, within the the um, logic of the uh, non-standard and rural dialects. So you're you're right that um, it that we should not confuse dialect differences with superiority and inferiority. On the other hand, uh, um, inculcating uh, knowledge of how to use the standard dialect, like driving on the right or using paper currency or using one computer file format versus another, is a, a, an invaluable skill and, and one would be putting students at a disadvantage in our society uh, not to educate them in the standard dialect just because it is standard. It's not better, but it is standard and there are advantages to mastering um, the standard conventions. Okay, thank you again.